Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So now we know that uh, the characteristics like uh, size and uh, interface between the precipitate and matrix, they change uh, with aging time, okay? So now what we are going to do, we are going to try to understand how the, these changes in the characteristic uh, are going to affect the way dislocations interact with the precipitate, okay? So let's try to understand that. So dislocations, can interact with the precipitate in two ways. Okay. The first one is dislocations. can cut or say share the precipitates okay and the second one is it can bypass the precipitate okay or we call it say bowing Going around of dislocations. Okay, we also call sometimes as bypassing. I'm going to explain each of these okay, one by one. And uh, depending upon whether the dislocations are cutting or sharing the precipitate or bowing around uh, of dislocations. The interactions, uh, the strength of the material, or say in this case, we are talking about focusing on aluminum alloys, the strength of aluminum alloys is going to change. Okay. So let's talk about the first one the sharing or cutting of the precipitate. Okay. Sharing of precipitates okay so the name itself suggests that you have a precipitate okay and the dislocation is coming okay and it cuts or it shares the precipitate okay it's like you have a watermelon and you have a knife and you're cutting it so you can imagine something like that okay so suppose you have a dislocation so this is your dislocation line and you have a precipitate, let me change the color. Okay, so you have this precipitate here and you have dislocation. So this is your precipitate. And this is your dislocation. Okay, so dislocation is moving on its slip plane. It finds a precipitate there. Okay, now it, uh, I have already mentioned, now it can do two things. It can either cut it or it can bypass it. Okay, the dislocation can bypass it. Right now we are talking about cutting of the precipitate. Okay, so when it interacts, when it cuts it, the precipitate is going to be something like this. Something like 
So it is going to create two new surfaces. Okay, so it is going to cut. So this is cutting after cutting. So it has cut the precipitate. Okay, so I have the schematic also. So this is how the schematic looks like. So you have a slip plane here. So this is your slip plane for that particular dislocation. And this is your half plane. Uh, and this particular line, the blue line here is your dislocation line and buzzer vector is also shown in red, right? And uh, the circle here, the sphere here is your precipitate. So this one is your precipitate, this guy here, okay? So now the dislocation is moving on its slip plane. You can see in the bottom one here, dislocation is moving in the slip plane. It, as soon as it reaches to the precipitate, it cuts it, okay? This is after cutting, okay? And this I have taken from Professor Anand Subramaniam's lecture note. Uh, he is a professor at IIT Kanpur, okay? So this is how dislocation is going to cut the precipitate. Now, uh, So there are six properties of the particle which can affect the way a dislocation uh, interact or in this case, uh, precipitation can be shared, okay? Let's try to understand those. So six properties. Of the particle or precipitate. affect the ease at which it can be shared. Okay, so what are those six properties? The first one is coherency strain. And this one we have already studied before, isn't it? So in the coherency strain, as I mentioned before, that whenever you have a coherent interface, you are going to have some amount of strain associated with it, right? Now a dislocation moves on a slip plane, it comes near to the precipitate, dislocation already have a strain field associated with it. Now you have coherency strain associated with the mat, uh, uh, precipitate, isn't it? So these two strain fields are going to interact, okay? So coherency strain is there. Second one is stacking fault energy. So if there is a significant difference between the stacking fault of uh, uh, particle or precipitate and the matrix, right? So the local variation of the fault width uh, uh, will, um, uh, will affect the interaction between the dislocation and the precipitate. So that is the second factor. Now the third is order structure. Okay. So the, if the precipitate has an order structure and typically most of the precipitates are going to have some uh, sort of uh, order structures, especially AL2CU uh, and other precipitates, right? They, they, are, uh, they are going to have order structures. So if they have order structures and dislocation, uh, you know, share them, then you are going to introduce anti-phase boundaries, okay? And that will also try to enhance the strength. 
Now the fourth one is modulus effect. Now if the precipitate and the matrix, uh, 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 both have different uh, modulus, right? And the remember the dislocation energy is also associated with the modulus, right? So if dislocation moves from the matrix to the precipitate and it shares it, it is going to change the energy of the dislocation, isn't it? So that will also require some, some amount of energy. It might decrease or increase, okay? But there will be changing the energy of the dislocation, isn't it? So that is the fourth effect. The fifth is interfacial energy. Now, if you see uh, what I showed before, so you are going to create new interfaces here, right? Now, the creation of these new interfaces uh, will also require some amount of extra energy. So it will also enhance the strength, okay? So that is what, when I wrote uh, interfacial energy, that is what I mean, okay? So uh, creation of uh, in new interfaces will require extra amount of energy. And the last one is lattice friction stress. So both matrix and the precipitate, both are going to have their internal frictional stresses, right? Like your pearls stress, okay? So when a dislocation moves from the matrix to the uh, precipitate and try, tries to share it, right? So you are going to, uh, dislocation is going to observe different friction stresses, okay? So these are the six points or six properties of the precipitate which can affect uh, uh, by which, uh, by the way, a dislocation is sharing the precipitate, okay? Now I have listed uh, the uh, formula uh, related to all these effects. This is taken by the book of Dieter, from the book of Dieter. Okay, so like tolerancy strain, you have a factor of uh, epsilon here. So this is your tolerancy strain. And if you see all of these properties are depending upon uh, the radius, radius of the precipitate. Okay, so overall, if you see, uh, you can go through this uh, formula. It is it is standard and it is given in all the books. But you know there might be some variations in terms of the constant, etc. Otherwise, the uh, concept remains the same. Okay, so overall, cutting or sharing of the precipitates will be preferred when the precipitate is coherent and small in size. So dislocation will try to cut the precipitate when it is smaller in size and the interface is coherent, okay? So overall, the dislocation will prefer to share or cut the precipitate when it is small in size and the interface between precipitate and 
matrix is coherent so it has to be smaller in size and coherent interface okay so if a dislocation is moving on the slip plane it finds a precipitate right the dislocation will prefer to cut it or shear it if the precipitate size is small and the interface is coherent okay now if the pre precipitate side becomes larger and larger and that is what we also discussed before isn't it that with respect to time the precipitate size is going to increase so after certain amount of time the precipitate size will be larger and now the dislocation will find it very difficult to cut because the stress required to cut the precipitate will be higher if the radius is higher okay so typically the stress required to share the precipitate varies proportional to root r okay so if the uh, radius is higher stress is for cutting the precipitate is also going to be higher so after you know some amount of time your precipitate size is large enough that dislocation will find it to cut it now what to do now the second option is there the instead of cutting dislocation is will try to bypass the precipitate or there will be bowing of the dislocation okay so the second option is bypassing right bypassing the precipitates or bowing of dislocations Okay. So when precipitate size is too large, to be shared. then dislocations find a way to move around move around the precipitates okay so if the size is very large okay dislocation will find it difficult to cut it because the stress is proportional to root r so it is going to bypass the precipitate and how does it do it so let's see it so suppose you have two precipitate something like this and then you have a dislocation which is moving under the applied stress of tau okay this is your dislocation okay now after some time it is going to close near to the precipitate and then it has to bypass it right so it is it what it will do it since it cannot cut it it will bow around the precipitate okay so let me first draw the precipitates so that i can show the sequence okay so all these are your precipitates now let me move the dislocations nearer so as soon as it reaches to it it is going to bow going to be something like this okay so this is say situation number 1 situation number 2 Where dislocation is bowing, okay. 
now what will happen after some time it will bow more so situation is going to be something like this Okay, now if you see the dislocation line vector direction is going to be this way, isn't it? So see the direction of arrow. Okay, so now at these two points, this point here, this point here, similarly this point here, and this point here, okay? The direction of this location line vector is opposite, isn't it? So what is going to happen? They are going to annihilate, okay? So finally, what you are going to have a loop of this location because these two sessions here, so these two sessions, right? This point, let me change the color now. Uh, so this particular point and this point, they are going to annihilate. Similarly, these two points of the dislocation vector, uh, they are going to annihilate, okay? And finally, they are going to leave a loop around the precipitate, and then this dislocation will move forward, okay? So you have now generated two loops, one, this one here, and another one here, okay? So see, you have now learned a way of generating more number of dislocations also. So you had one dislocation, which uh, was moving on the slip plane, and then it observes two precipitates, which are of larger size. It cannot, uh, can, cannot cut them. So it bows around the precipitate, and by doing that, it also generates new number of uh, dislocations, more number of dislocations. Okay, so you have learned a new method of generation of dislocations. Okay, so overall, if I write under applied stress tau. the dislocation bows in between the particle, right? You can see it, number two here, sequence number two, between the precipitates, okay? And after that, the, uh, what is going to happen? The segment of dislocations with opposite direction, they are going to annihilate, right? So the segments of dislocation with opposite direction Right, or opposite line vector cancel each other. Right, and by doing that, they form a new loop, right? So, dislocation loops. Okay, so uh, if the particle size, precipitate size is larger, dislocations are going to bow around the precipitate. And if it is smaller, uh, 
then the dislocation is going to cut through the precipitate, right? Now, as far as the stress is concerned, stress can be given as two alpha GB by uh, say lambda, where lambda is the distance between the two particles or precipitate. So if you have one and second precipitate here, so this distance, okay. So if this is lambda, so this, the stress increment in the stress for bowing the dislocation will be given as two alpha GB by lambda, where lambda is the interparticle distance or spacing. Okay. So overall here, if I want to write similar to what I wrote in the cutting of the precipitate, so overall I can write that Boeing around of dislocations will be preferred when the dislocation sorry not the dislocation when the precipitate size size is large okay So, uh, if the precipitate size is small, dislocation is going to cut. If it is large, it is going to bypass. Dislocation is going to bypass. So, now let's combine both of them and try to understand how the shear stress, this delta uh, tau, right, or tau is going to vary with respect to size of the precipitate, which is somewhat related to the aging time also, right? Because if we increase the aging time, the size of the precipitate is going to increase, okay? So let me draw. So here we have tau, okay, shear stress. And then uh, in on the S axis, we have particle radius or precipitate radius, say R. Now, now we know that if we increase the precipitate size, particle size, your uh, uh, stress required to share the precipitate is going to increase. Okay, so let me draw it. So something like this. Okay, so this black curve, dotted curve, will belong to cutting of precipitates. Okay. Now let me draw another one corresponding to the uh, bowing of dislocation. Okay. Bypassing the precipitate, right? So that is going to vary something like this. Okay, because the bowing of uh, dislocation around the precipitate is inversely proportional to R, because as we increase the R, the distance between the particle or precipitate is going to reduce. Okay. Oh, sorry, it's going to increase. Okay, so overall the strength, the stress required to bow in the dislocation uh, around the precipitate is also going to reduce. Okay. 
So now let if I combine these two, my net term is going to look something like this. Okay. So the blue one here is for Boeing of dislocations and the final red one is the net curve okay and the maximum here will correspond to a radius let's say we call this radius as rc or critical radius Okay, so below the critical radius, now if you see this curve, our overall curve is now the red one. Okay, so below the critical radius, we have cutting of precipitates. Okay, and above the critical radius, the bowing of this situation is going to be dominant mechanism. Okay, so the mechanism changes with respect to radius. So uh, with, this, with aging time, the radius of the precipitate or precipitate size is increasing. As soon as it reaches to a particular radius, say here in this, this critical radius, your mechanism is going to change from cutting of the precipitate to bowing around the precipitate. Okay, And at the critical radius, both mechanisms are going to be active together, isn't it? Okay, so this is how the strength of a material is dependent upon the parti uh, particle radius or precipitate size. Okay. So we can write here that uh, as precipitate size increases, you know, there will be increment in the sharing stress. Okay. Now, second, we can write a critical radius RC it's reached when both, right? Both are comparable for cutting as well as bowing. When bowing is comparable to that of sharing. This means both will be active. Both mechanisms will be active. And after this, after uh, it reaches to critical radius, you have only bowing, right? Bowing of dislocations dominant. Okay, so this is how the characteristics of precipitate size and interface will determine the sh shear stress required. Okay.
so it changes with respect to size of the precipitate okay so now let's come to something called aging curve uh, which typically uh, you know all experiments will try uh, to find out when we talk about the aging behavior of aluminum alloy or precipitation strengthening in aluminum alloy okay so let's understand what is aging curve okay so what we do here we plot hardness versus aging time okay now we know uh, that uh, with respect to aging time the size of the precipitate is going to change and that will also lead to the change in the shear stress required okay so here we are going to plot the hardness of the sample with respect to time okay and uh, how do we do the experiments so what we do we take number of samples suppose i want to do the same experiment for uh, aluminum 4% proper and i want to generate the curve so let's say aluminum 4 weight percent proper we are taking this particular alloy and i want to generate the aging curve for this alloy so what I'm going to do, I'm going to cut the alloy in small, small samples, number of samples. And I'm going to put all the samples together in the furnace. Okay, artificial aging we are doing. Okay, so uh, the first step is solution treatment. So we will go to high temperature, make it single phase, put okay, all the samples together, and then uh, we will quench it. Okay, all the samples we are going to quench one by one and then we will go we are going to place all the samples together in another furnace which will be maintained at a lower temperature say t2 we have discussed what t2 is right to perform the aging treatment okay now for all, uh, we have kept all the samples now after some amount of time we will take out one sample say t1 then another sample at t2 another sample at t3 and so on and then for each sample, we are going to measure the hardness of that particular sample. In that way, what we are going to get is something like this. So we are going to plot time on the x-axis. Then here we are going to have hardness on the y-axis. And this is aging time here. Okay, so we are going to have one hardness at time t equal to zero. That means after quenching, we have not started aging yet for that particular sample. Okay, now another sample we have taken out from the uh, uh, furnace, say at t1, and we obtain one hardness value, which will be say here. Then at t2, we are obtain another hardness value here then T3 here and so on, we are going to get number of data points, isn't it? Something like this. Okay, now if I join this particular line, the curve is going to look similar to what we just learned about the variation of shear stress with respect to particle size. And this particular curve is known as aging curve. Okay, and now why do we aging, call it aging curve, right? Because we are keeping the sample at a particular temperature for long time, okay? So it's like aging. Okay, with age, we also age. The sample is also going to age. Okay, that's why this whole phenomena is also called age hardening. With respect to age, the material is hardened. Okay, so we call it age hardening. And this particular curve here is called aging curve. Okay. So this hardness, the maximum. So remember, the curve is similar to what we just saw for shear stress versus the particle size. Okay, so now let me draw it again and then I will mark these regions separately. 
तो एज इन टाइम हार्डनेस and then your curve is going to look something like this okay now this particular point where it is zero the only contribution of towards the hardness will be from the lattice stress as well as solid solution strengthening and we'll discuss it eventually okay solid solution strengthening because we have not formed any uh, precipitate but this is a condition Uh, if you remember, it is super saturated solid solution. So you have lots of solutes present in the uh, matrix. Okay. So if I uh, talk about aluminum four percent proper, you have lots of proper in aluminum matrix, and because of those solutes, you are going to have some amount of hardness, right? And that will be called uh, solid solution strengthening. So we will come to that particular point. and after this particular point your strains uh, hardness is going to increase because of the formation of precipitates and at a high uh, some uh, time here your hardness is maximum okay and this particular condition if i take this particular uh, any alloy and age it to this particular time here Okay, this particular time, that particular condition of the alloy is called peak age condition. So, the highest hardness corresponds to peak. Age condition. Okay, so this particular condition is peak age. And name itself suggests, isn't it? Peak age, peak, peak of. So uh, see it as a valley. Okay. Mountain. Not valley, mountain, right? So the peak of the mountain. So this is called peak age condition. Now below peak age, we have under age. So this whole region here will be called under age. You have a condition which is under age. It has not reached to peak age level yet. Above peak age, if we have uh, age the sample to uh time which is more than the peak age condition time we call it over aged okay so you have aged more than what is required in in that sense if i imagine right so it is more than the peak age so you have over aged the sample okay so we have three conditions over aged peak aged and under aged and the highest hardness will correspond to the peak age condition now if i take aluminum 4% proper i already mentioned before the sequence of the precipitation is going to be alpha will be then gp jones then you have theta double prime to theta prime to theta and if i try to mark all these precipitates in the aging curve where these precipitates are forming i can say that the gp jones will be somewhere here then theta double prime will be in this regime theta prime here and then over aged will be mostly theta equilibrium condition and theta will be much much larger in size okay so the shape is again similar to the what we just discussed about the shear stress versus precipitate size okay and remember there is a correlation between aging time and precipitate size also so as aging time increases precipitate size also increases so your stress is going to increase so hardness is also going to increase that means in this particular region here up to this point you are going to have sharing of the precipitate will be dominant 
okay and after that after it has reached to peak age both sharing and bowing will be temperable okay both will be active and after that uh, in the over age condition your bowing of the dislocation will be dominant mechanism okay so this is how the aging curve looks like now we have discussed about the uh, uh, temperature right uh, effect of aging time but uh, what is the effect of temperature we also need to uh, know about it right so till now whatever we have discussed is for a particular temperature so the plot why what i have just shown the aging curve is for a particular temperature so what happens when we change the temperature if we increase the temperature what will happen to peak age hardness whether it will move left side or whether it will decrease or increase or similarly what will be the effect on the uh, time okay peak a, a time to reach the peak hardness whether it will also decrease or increase so next we are going to talk about that concept